And joining me now are two former Supreme Court clerks, Jennifer Mascott, an assistant law professor at George Mason University. She clerked for Justice Kavanaugh while he was on the D.C. Circuit and for Justice Thomas on the Supreme Court. And Andrew Crespo is a professor at Harvard Law School. He has clerked for Justices Kagan and Breyer. Jennifer and Andrew, welcome uh, to Meet the Press. Let me start with the leak uh, and how Bush v. Gore, Andrew, didn't seem to create personal divisions on the court the way the leak of Dobbs did. What's your sense of what's going on behind the scenes? You know, Chuck, we have to remember there was an investigation into this leak, right? Mm -hmm. And I think that investigation produced a 20-page report taught us three pretty important things. First, the report seems to make clear that this leak did not come from a law clerk or a court employee. Right? This was an investigation done by experienced criminal investigators. Mm -hmm. It was reviewed by the secretary, former Secretary of Homeland Security, looked at forensic cell phone records, and it asked every employee and law clerk who had access to that opinion to swear under oath, exposing themselves to a potential prison term for penalty of perjury, that they didn't do that they were not the leaker and that they didn't know who was. Mm -hmm. It basically ruled out court employees and law clerks. But crucially, and this is, I think, the second really important thing that this investigation uh, highlights for us, the report was not able to rule out whether or not the leak came from the justices themselves. Because the only people who had access to the opinion and who were not investigated within the, within right. the leak investigation were the justices. Because the court didn't look at the justices themselves in that investigation. And I think that shows us really the third most important thing that we learned from this. The leak investigation is one example now in a string of many where we're seeing the Supreme Court justices basically view themselves as above the law, not subject to the same rules as everyone else. Whether that's the leak investigation, whether it's accepting potentially millions of dollars in gifts without having to disclose it, mm -hmm. whether it's refusing to adopt an ethics code, refusing to even engage with Congress on that question, this is a court that tells everyone else what they can and cannot do. Tells Congress you can't regulate yeah. guns, tells the president you can't do anything about climate change, tells women what they have to do with their own bodies, but says to everyone else, don't you dare try and suggest that we have to follow rules for ourselves. Jennifer, what's your sense of what the leak has done to trust between the nine? Well, I have to tell you, last year at this time, we were talking right after the leak. And um, from my standpoint over the last year, it's actually reconfirmed my faith in the Supreme Court as an institution. Because I think here we have nine justices who have taken an incredible amount of attack and vitriol from the outside. We've had assassination attempts. And quite frankly, the Dobbs opinion when it was handed down was almost precisely the same as it was when the leak was made. And that Why does that matter? Well, I think because it shows that the justices have fidelity to principle, that they didn't let the attacks, the threats, the attempt to change the outcome have any impact at all. So had it changed, had the ruling been different from the leak, you think this would be a far more explosive a thing inside the institution? Well, I think clearly that would have depended what the change was. Obviously, if mm -hmm. there had been a vote change of some kind, that would right. have certainly communicated that those kinds of tactics work. But I think it's really astounding that it's the justices who are facing the attacks from the outside. And here, you know, we are questioning uh, the institution. The institution's strong. They're continuing to do their jobs. Just this week, as the uh, clip you played shows, Chief Justice Roberts and Justice Kagan were together uh, with Justice Roberts receiving an award, talking about the collegiality of the institution, despite all of the buffeting on the outside that's continuing to go on. Let me talk about ethics. When you guys are brought in as clerks, do you sign anything? Is there an eth what is there a bat what what do you pledge? Is there anything you put into writing pledging some sort of fidelity to the court? Well, nobody's asking anybody to pledge fidelity, I don't think, to any institution. I think all law clerks, just like government employees across the board, are trying to be hired. We want people of integrity who are there to serve the institution and the principle of the law and the Constitution. And so, like all federal officials, clerks obviously are supposed to take an oath right. to uphold the Constitution and try to do that and serve the justices as they apply principles of law. But is there any look, is there anything about your personal financial situation? And the background check? Yeah, is there a no. basic background When check? I was there, this was, you know, uh, 10 years ago or so now, um, I don't remember having to sign anything, but I do remember very early in the year, the Chief Justice, I didn't clerk for the Chief Justice, mm -hmm. but the Chief Justice would get all of the law clerks, 30 plus of us, into a room, and it was the ethics talk, and it was almost entirely don't talk outside of this building about what happens in this building. This was well before Dobbs. It was really impressed on law You clerks. violating this right now? <laughs> no, I don't think so. I think okay. the chief has made clear that he wants that, you know, that that, that that was something impressed upon law clerks. You're not supposed to talk outside of the court about the opinions and work of the court. Um, so there wasn't like a, uh, as I recall, a signing, but it was very much impressed on law clerks that you're not supposed to disclose what happens inside the building, then Jen or ever. Jennifer, do you remember political debates? 
political debates within in, in, the yeah, institution? Within the institution. Not legal debates, not constitutional debates, but just good old-fashioned political debates. To be honest, not really that much. I mean, I, th I feel like there was a striking amount of collegiality. And actually, if you look at the most recent terms, the last 10 terms of the court, I think, there are at least 40% or more of the merits-based decisions that are issued unanimously. So a lot of times on the outside, we talk about the handful of decisions that seem to be quote unquote political or controversial, but the court has got really challenging issues coming to it. A lot of times there are issues that are not necessarily the topic of dinnertime conversation. And I really love the opportunity to be able to meet clerks from across the spectrum and still keep up with many of them today in my practice as a law professor. Let me move to the issue of what's deemed the shadow docket. And maybe you guys can explain this. Let me put up a statistic up here. And this is about sort of administration when, when the Department of Justice on behalf of an executive branch is looking for emergency relief during the, the four terms of Bush and Obama, uh, eight times the Supreme Court was asked for emergency relief. In the one term of Donald Trump, 41 times. Um, it appears that this is no longer emergency relief. This is political disputes. Have, and we never know what the rationale is. Has this gotten overused, Andrew? I think we're seeing uh, a greater uh, sort of frequency of folks turning to the judiciary. And one of the biggest challenges now is that parties can pick their judges in the lower courts. Right? You can file a lawsuit in Texas, pick the, 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 the location where you're going to file the lawsuit, and there will be one judge who's going to hear that case. And you know the political party who appointed that judge, and you know the political balance of that judge. When you see parties rushing to the judiciary and getting to pick the lower court judges, mm -hmm. it's an accelerant that forces everything up faster to the Supreme Court. Mm -hmm. And it's making the Supreme Court, which is now a very conservative court, basically sitting in the driver's seat on all of these issues as they get shot up to the court and is using that shadow docket to act faster on these issues. And, and Jennifer, one of the complaints is that we don't know the rationale behind it. It's what, look, we can have a debate whether these should be ruled on, but then we don't even get a rationale. How do we change that? Well, I think to Andrew's point, it is true that the court is responding to these cases as they find them. And so it's often the lower courts or outside parties that are bringing these cases to the court's emergency docket. One, I mean, obviously, unique circumstance of the Trump administration was the pandemic. And so that caused a lot of state mm -hmm. orders that were not necessarily happening as rapidly in years uh, previous to that. And mm -hmm. so that increased the use of the orders docket. But I think the court has been attentive to people wanting to understand its reasoning. And so some of these cases actually have resulted in written decisions, mm -hmm. perhaps not as lengthy as the merits ones. Uh, in fact, there have even been oral argument uh, right. issued more um, rapidly sometimes in cases when the courts wanted to rule on issues of big importance. So I think the court is trying to uh, issue its reasoning for the American public. And quite frankly, in some ways, is one of the most transparent institutions in the sense that at least with the merits cases, we're getting dozens and dozens of pages, right. lengthy reasoning from the justices. Looking for transparency, <laughs> that is no transparent institution. But I understand within the legal community your argument there. Jennifer Mascott, Andrew Crespo, thank you both for being out here. I appreciate it. Thank Thanks you for having us. Up next.